Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 164, we're going to talk about the lovely mid range. And we also have a big announcement to make about the new uh, phono kits that are coming out today. But first, caution everyone the <coughs> electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, the Cyber Monday first ever kit promotion was a huge hit. We had to hustle to get all the kits shipped. But I'm happy to say they're all outbound. And a big thank you to everyone who participated in the Black Friday sale. It's our way to say thank you to you, you, the viewers, to our great customers, and of course to the kit builders. And of course, we can't give you a big hug um, because, well, you know, you're on the screen, but yeah, everybody gets a big hug. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with the coming season, many of us will need one, I think. Uh, so later in today's show, we're going to announce the release of our new Universal 6 or 12 SL7 kit phono preamp. And we'll take a look at all of the great reviews that are coming in. That should be fun. But before we do that, let's talk about the mid range. So, about a month ago, I talked about the importance of bass reproduction. And I thought, now is a good time to talk about the mid range. And given that roughly 90% of all the music we listen to is recorded in the mid range, you would think this would be a constant topic of discussion online among audiophiles but you rarely hear anyone talking about it. Okay, so what in the heck is the mid-range? Well, I would say it starts about 250 hertz, or cycles as the old timers used to call it, and ends at two kilohertz. I used to have a family friend years and years ago who was um, a, a German trained tech. He worked in helicopters and um, and uh, he always talked about uh, Hertz as cycles. That's how he learned. And a lot of old timers uh, know uh, frequency as a cycle. And we'll look at why that is in just a minute. Okay, well, let's take a look at this little scribble that I've done and see how the mid range sort of fits in with all the frequency bands. So the bass we just talked about a, a month or so ago, it runs roughly zero to 250 Hertz. And it's a long, low wave. We'll get back to the time in just a second. Mid-range, roughly 250 to 2000 hertz. Or in the short form for 2000 would be 2 kilohertz, right? 2000 hertz. And uh, it's, it's more of a compact, shorter wave. And the treble, roughly, it's going to run 2,000 to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. And it's a very short, steep wave. Now, I've sketched these out. This is how, um, how a scope would show these waves. And, um, and it's easier to understand these waves a little bit better uh, if you know about how the time works. So, really what you're seeing is a time aligned display of the frequency uh, curve, right? So these are all starting at and ending in the same time frame. So if we look at how time works with frequency, you can easily calculate any time for a complete cycle and a complete cycle starts anywhere and ends anywhere like this. So if we start at the bottom of the wave here, we would come all the way up, all the way down, and we would end here, right? So that's 360 degrees. This from here up to here would be 180 degrees. So when you hear somebody talking about something being 180 degrees at a phase, that means instead of being in the negative phase, 
Ah, you say, okay, it's up here, it's in the positive phase, right? This is on a scope, this is your positive, and down here is your negative. And on your speaker drivers, when the cone is pushing out, it's in the positive phase, and it would be here, right? It would be developing from the bottom of the negative phase. It would be here developing the push up to here. There's probably a bit of a lag, so nobody get technical on me. <laughs> and when the speaker cone is pulling back, it's on this phase here, right? Okay. <laughs> so time is easy to calculate. So if you had, let's say, uh, in the base frequencies, you had 200 hertz, so that's near the top of the bass band. You would take one and divide it by 200, and you would get 0 0.005 seconds. And that would be one full 360 degree cycle, right? Now, if you were to look at um, 2000 or 2 kilohertz uh, in the mid range, you would add a zero. So you would be 0.0005, three zeros and a five. <laughs> so you can see how the mid range moves a lot quicker than the bass frequencies. And of course, you can feel and hear that. And the treble, you add yet another zero and you end up with four zeros and a five. If you're talking about um, 200 hertz, 2000 or 20,000 hertz, right? So, and you can, on a scope, of course, um, we can amplify that and you can hear it immediately. But when we're testing equipment on the bench um, and we've got an output transformer, the transformer will actually vibrate and you can, you can, you don't need a speaker on the bench. You can hear your frequencies. Well, you don't hear the very low waves, um, but once you get somewhere in the mid band, you can start to hear it. Maybe the bottom of the mid range. So these long, low waves, they're, they're really tough to, to record, they're tough to amplify, they get lost in the room, um, and it's not hard to see why. They're just slow, meandering, taking their time. It's like they have a smoke on the way to your ear, right? <laughs> I don't know if anybody's allowed to talk about smoking anymore. Uh, anyways, the mid-range, it's, it's clipping along at... at a good rate and uh, as you can see here you've got a full a full cycle is 0 0.005 seconds so it's it doesn't have a problem getting around the room in fact it will reflect itself around the room all over the place so if you've got second harmonics third fourth fifth sixth seventh etc um, but the dominant is normally your second harmonic it's mostly going to be in the mid-range and up into some of the treble, but higher frequencies up in the treble, they don't move that well through materials. They get kind of trapped. I've got an ultrasonic uh, record cleaner that I, I got stuck in a, in a room well away from the living accommodations because the high frequencies of those suckers, I think I've got two transducers in that, or is it four? I forget, anyways. Um, the very high frequencies that it operates in, if I close the door, you can still hear it, but a lot of that sound gets, gets trapped. But if it was running at um, 200 cycles, we'd probably feel that throughout the house because it would get into the, it's a wooden house, so it would start vibrating the floor. <laughs> Anyways, so... I think it's probably going to be easier to understand um, talking about the mid-range driver itself if we just pop over to the music room. Okay, through the magic of editing, and Charles, by the way, is editing this, but he got two of his vaccinations at the same time yesterday, and it took him six hours to really crash, <laughs> the poor guy. So anyways, he's under the weather, so I don't think he'll make an appearance today but he'll be back up and running next week. Okay, let's head over to the music room. Okay, well, welcome to the music room. And here, you've seen this before, but these are our custom open baffles. Uh, I built 12 versions of this speaker. 
<laughs> and subsequently we've done a number of modifications or upgrades to them and this is the best sounding uh, speaker system by far that I've ever heard including um, uh, comparing them to a commercial uh, $10,000 each no it was 10,000 for the pair anyways um, speakers box speakers so but you know we listen to a lot of acoustic music and uh, so acoustic jazz acoustic classical um, vocal and open baffles excel at acoustic music they really do whereas you know if you're a high distortion rock and roller edm kind of a listener you're going to probably like a box speaker sound better but anyways the, so down here we've got we've got the woofer box this is an h frame we've talked about that before up here we've got a a, a 10 inch mid-range this is a paper cone and we'll get back to this in just a minute and up here we've got a waveguide um, uh, soft dome tweeter and um, this was the foundation of the original build the very first prototype speaker system that I built uh, in the OB format or dipole speaker format had this this uh, mid-range woofer and this may look like a really substantial cone, but actually uh, this, this and most uh, paper cone speakers are really, they have, they have almost no mass to them. And a very light mass is a big part of getting really quick transients and paper, paper, especially in the mid range, in my opinion, but also in the bass frequencies, Paper cone speakers have a very natural sound to them that you just can't get with these modern composite cones, you know, spun copper and, you know, um, years ago, um, plastic cones were all the rage and geez, they, you know, they sound plasticky. <laughs> um, anyways, um, you might say, why in the heck is your mid-range so bloody big? You don't need a big speaker for mid-range, do you? Something this big could easily handle the mid-range frequencies, um, you know, all the way up to a good wattage. And the reason is um, tonality improves, in my opinion, when you have a nice sized diaphragm and dispersion. So when you're listening uh, in a mid-size to uh, fairly, I mean, we have a, what would be called a standard living room from the 60s. So it's actually, by today's standards, is actually fairly large. And it's very acoustically alive. You probably can hear that. We've got plaster ceiling, plaster walls. We've got a lot of windows um, that have treatment, so that helps. And we've got a wooden floor that has some treatment. And we've got a lot of wooden furniture. So. There's a lot of stuff that happens acoustically in this room. It doesn't record that well, but it sounds amazing. So a bigger diaphragm like this helps a lot in a bigger room. It basically fills the room with sound. So that instead of having to sit in a precise pinpoint position to hear a good um, uh, sound stage, you can move around quite a bit in this room and the sound stage mostly stays intact. And that, in my opinion, is really valuable. It's, you know, if you have a setup in which you've got a dedicated listening room and you have the listening chair in the spot, centered perfectly, perfect distance away from uh, the speakers, you sit in that chair and you don't move your head and you get an absolute perfect presentation, that's all well and good. But most of us want to live in our living rooms. We don't have... Um, a space for a dedicated listening room and besides we like to move around while we're listening to music at least I do um, so you know during key passages I'm going to stay put but during a lot of my listening sessions I have other things that I like to putter around with and you know having that wide dispersion makes it just makes a huge difference but the tonality of of a paper coned mid-range I can't stress how much of an improvement that is okay well hopefully that helps everyone out well hopefully that helped you a little bit 
um, understand better the importance of the mid-range. And, well, I mean, all the bands, the bass through to the mid-range and treble are all extremely important. But my goodness, if you don't get the mid-range right, you, you don't got nothing. <laughs> okay, so the test builders are almost all done uh, with the, the new Universal 6 or 12 SL7 kit phono preamp and the reviews are starting to come into the store and a big shout out by the way to all of the test builders we we learn um, so much from the test builders not so much about you know d design errors and things like that by the time the the kits go out to the test builders the circuit's been built in so many iterations and has so many hundreds of hours of testing on it both on the bench and in our listening room that the circuit and um, how they sound really isn't uh, an issue. It's more about, you know, the, the little um, problems that they might find with the assembly of the kit. Maybe we've, our, st our uh, inventory pull list is missing a part and we, or we're a little short on some wire. We try to put extras of everything in the kits so that we don't have those problems. But that's one of the things the test builders do. But they, they uncover things that we had no idea even existed. So we had, um, for the first time ever, um, on, on my bench or with a kit that shipped out, we had a filter capacitor go bad. And it went, of course, that when they go bad, they go bad in a hurry. Luckily, there was no big bang moment it was it just must have had an internal short and uh, luckily uh, the test builder was experienced and was able to troubleshoot it fairly quickly and we it you know it means now that of course we have to we had to go through and, and check all of the filter capacitors from that supplier. And he got unlucky. I haven't found a single bad one in, um, in the entire order. So, but anyways, um, that's the sort of thing that test builders are great for is finding things out that we had no idea <laughs> exist. So anyways, th a big thank you to all of the test builders. There'll probably be some more reviews as the last ones, uh, catch up and finish up, but let's just go over, um, the three that are in so far. And if you've stayed till the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. The We're in the, what I call the Christmas rush period. And luckily we put a lot of excellent inventory into the store for, um, for the Black Friday sale, and we still have a lot of it left. We did sell a lot of, lot of premium stuff, but we had a lot. So we still have um, pretty good inventory right across all the tube types. And people are getting their tubes in now uh, for Christmas listening, and that's a real thing. Um, and in fact, the reason why we pushed the uh, phono preamp out the door when we did was we always had a goal to have it available for people who wanted to build over the Christmas season. That's a lot of kit builders have time between Christmas and New Year's and they buy kits at this time of year. It's just a thing. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, so there's still some good discount codes to use. There is, if you have a bigger order, there is a couple of hidden codes. One's really easy to figure out. And one, you got to spend the big bucks for, and then you get the big code. <laughs> and only one person has ever used that. Uh, anyways, and if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. I'm missing Charles, but he'll be back soon. Cheers, everyone.